Hi, welcome back to McClatchy Maths. My name is Natalie McClatchy and today we are continuing our video series on how to write a PSMT, a problem solving modelling task. And this is for students and teachers in Queensland. We are on to our third section of the PSMT now called the evaluation. So we're going to be looking in this video particularly at reasonableness of results. It's a bit of a mouthful. In this video we're going to touch the different parts of your evaluation. We'll look at the difference between an evaluation and a plain statement, how to reflect on your reasonableness, how to all organize that evaluation and then we'll talk about what's coming up in our upcoming video series. So let's have a quick look at the ISMG. ISMG stands for our Instrument Specific Marking Guide and this is the section for evaluation and in our video we are looking at these two descriptors here. The evaluation of the reasonableness of solutions by considering the results, assumptions and observations. There's a lot of parts to that one and if we can hit that one, which I don't see students hitting all that often, but if we can hit it, we'll hit in the top four to five marks for our PSMT. When you don't get that particular one, then you drop straight down to the next box about statements about the reasonableness of solutions by considering the context of the task. Now you'll notice that there is a key difference between the first one and the second one. Firstly, it's an evaluation in the top, and if it's not evaluated, it's just a statement. So we need to unpack the meaning of evaluation versus statements. Also, you'll notice that the reasonableness of solutions is considered in both of those descriptors, but however, only one of them looks at the results and the assumptions and the observations, whereas the other one is just considering what is the context of the task. That would take into consideration some of the results, but you really do need to reflect back on those assumptions and observations you made at the beginning of your assignment and reflect on how reasonable they are in the context of your assignment. So if we don't do that looking back and reflecting, we can't hit that top descriptor. So let's talk about what our evaluation needs to include. Now this is the whole evaluation now, not just this particular descriptor, but the whole bit. So firstly, we need that assessment of the reasonableness of results. That's what we're gonna be talking about mainly in this video. There's also a reflection on the impact of those observations and assumptions. We also just mentioned that as well. That's really important to hit that top mark. Then we're going to consider the strengths and limitations. And we're going to talk about that more in an upcoming video, but this also forms part of your evaluation and make some recommendations on how your results might be improved because of those limitations in your assignment. And then we're going to implement those recommendations if we are in methods on specialist or if we are in essentials or general maths or not required to by our task sheet, we will just leave it as recommendations, not implementation. So this is where we're focusing in this particular video, those two purple dot points. So let's get right into it and talk about the difference between an evaluation and a statement. So here's the definition from the Queensland Curriculum Authority. They're saying that evaluation is making an appraisal by weighing up and assessing strengths, implications and limitations. So that is the strengths and limitations forms part of your evaluation, making judgments about ideas and works and solutions and methods in select related to selected criteria, examining and determining the merit, the value or the significance of something based on criteria. The most important part here is all of that is about making judgments. And that's what we're going to be talking about in this video. We're making judgments about whether our results are reasonable. Now, if we compare that to a sentence or a statement, you can see there's a lot more to evaluation than just writing a single sentence. You do need to write a few paragraphs here. And I would argue this is probably every bit as important as the introduction of your assignment. A lot of students get really hung up on observations and assumptions. That section being formulate is worth four. This section is worth five. So evaluation is really important. Unfortunately, a lot of students do leave it to the last minute or the night before, and then it really shows and reflects. Some students start really well on their assignments and just seem to run out of steam at the end. It's not a good idea. We really wanna make sure that we put the time in. So let's talk about what it's meant by reasonable. Well, the definition from the QCAA as well is that it's endowed with reason, obviously, having sound judgment, and there's that word judgment again. We're deciding and choosing between different things. Is it good, is it bad, is it fair, is it sensible, is it appropriate, is it moderate, is it average? So we're looking about whether our solution makes sense in a real life context. Is it what we expect, is it not what we expect? Would it work if we had to implement it? And our solutions, we need to justify our solutions and um, show that we can apply that back to the context in some way. Okay, so that's where we're focusing now is on those reasonableness of results. And we'll get straight into that. 
What is a result, you might be asking? Well, a result could include a number of things. It could be a graph that you created to represent some data. So you do need to reflect on that graph. Is it what you're expecting to see? Is it um, what you would expect to see in a real life context? If you develop an equation or a model of some kind that you've developed through algebraic techniques or other techniques, that's part of your results as well. It could also be a scale drawing or a map or a design that you've come up with to solve a problem of some kind. It could also be an answer to a posed question. And you'll notice that question is on your task sheet. Um, it might be something like, is there a relationship between X and Y? That's the question that's been posed to you. Your result could also include a budget. So if you're doing budgeting in general maths or in essential maths, that could be part of your solutions and your results. All the results could be the optimal outcome of something and that particularly affects our students in methods when we're looking at maximizing solutions or minimizing solutions to get an optimal outcome for a real life context. Now the first thing you need to ask yourself is your result logical? So when you come up with that result of whatever kind it is, is it logical in some way? So for example, if you were comparing arm length to leg length and doing some bivariate data analysis on that, and you found out that there was weak correlation, would you be expecting weak correlation between two body parts of the same person? Probably not. You'd be expecting most bodies would probably grow in proportion to one another at approximately the same rate. So then if you're finding out that that hasn't actually happened. You would say, well, that's not quite logical. It's not what was expected. You would need to discuss that. There could be some very good reasons why that is not what you expected out of your results. So you need to make, also think about, does it make sense in a real life context? So back to the arm length and the leg length. If I measured young children's arm lengths and leg lengths, they are still growing. And we all know children and teenagers grow at different rates. Sometimes they shoot up and their legs are really, really long. And then suddenly their arms and their torso comes into proportion. So if we found weak correlation among children, we would possibly be expecting that because they haven't finished growing yet. But we do need to discuss that weak correlation. With applying that model to a real life context, however, could we apply a children's model to adults and say this is going to be a model for if we found, say, femurs and um, leg bones on the ground, could we um, use the model we've created from children to apply to adults? You'd want to discuss that and say, well, that's probably not an appropriate application of the model because it was used, developed or developed from children who are not growing um, at the same rate, whereas adults have finished growing. So probably not an appropriate application. So it wouldn't make sense in a real life context to use a model from children to apply to adults. Think about any contradictions that take place within your models. For example, if you've done one graph and you found results um, proved one thing, but a second graph with a different data set proves something else, that could actually be a very real life um, occurrence. What might have caused the contradictions? You need to think quite deeply when you're doing this evaluation. It really is a time for thinking and for putting those thoughts into writing. Also, it's a great idea when you're writing your observations and assumptions to have a bit of an idea about where you expect the assignment's going to go. So for example, if you were creating a budget for a holiday and you knew that holiday was going to be in Europe and it was going to be for six weeks, well, your expectation is that's probably going to be quite an expensive holiday. Airfares will be expensive and six weeks of accommodation and activities will chew a massive hole in anyone's savings. So that's something you're going to want to think about at the beginning. If you then come up with a budget for $2,000 for six weeks in Europe, wow, take me with you, but you probably know that it's not going to be um, correct. So this also, this evaluation also gives you an opportunity to uncover any mistakes or errors that you may have made and to go back and fix them as part of your solve, part of your assignment. But also, if something confirms your expectation or is close to your expectation, but not quite there, that is something you can talk about in reasonableness of results. Have a think about what could have caused the differences. So for example, if you were budgeting for that holiday and you chose every single option as the cheapest, 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 cheapest accommodation, the longest airfares that took forever to get there, but they were super cheap, that might have caused those differences. So you would also want to be applying that to real life and saying, well, would it be reasonable that someone would actually want to take your holiday if it's going to be staying in the worst possible accommodation and taking the dodgiest cars and the longest flights? Possibly not, 
but you meet your budget criteria. So talk about how those results changed from your expectations, what could have caused the differences. You don't have to necessarily prove it here in the evaluation, you just need to comment on it and explain how it might have caused a difference. So we are now back to the reasonableness of solutions by looking at those assumptions and observations, which is the second part of this descriptor. So if you've assumed something at the beginning of your assignment and you've assumed that it will have no effect, is that realistic? Probably not. So for example, let's think about um, a situation with maybe bivariate data where we're comparing someone's screen time to their physical activity. And we might say that it is assumed that the person will do the same amount of screen time every single day forever in order to be able to assume that the model can be applied to all people. Well, that's not a realistic assumption. The assumption helps you to do the assignment and to uncover any relationship between the two variables. But it's not realistic to assume that something will stay the same forever because no person is ever on their phone for exactly the same number of minutes every single day. So this is where you then reflect and say, well, that actually wasn't a reasonable assumption. It was a necessary assumption to complete the task, but it wasn't reasonable. And so this could affect the usefulness of the solution to be applied to a real life context. So talk about all of those different impacts as well. It might have been a minor impact. It might have been a major impact. So you want to make sure that you just at least elaborate on that and discuss. You don't actually have to quantify that um, different impact of those different effects of your observations and assumptions. So you don't need to um, go and measure them or then go and reevaluate your model, taking those assumptions into consideration, unless potentially you're in methods or specialist, in which case you will have to implement some of your recommendations. But if you're in general or essential or other junior mathematics strands, you're merely speculating and discussing and elaborating on what those effects could have been and how big those effects might have been. So I'm going to take you through a few quick examples now on how to reflect on our observations and assumptions in our evaluation. And what I'm going to do is show you a quick reflection as a statement and then show you how to turn that into an evaluation. Now the example I've got first up is trigonometry. It is assumed that the tree is completely vertical in order to use the trigonometric ratios for right angle triangles. And those ratios we're talking about are sine, cosine and tan, Sokotoa. And we know that we need a 90 degree angle in a triangle to be able to use those particular formulas. So in real life, we would get very few trees that are absolutely vertical. But we need to make the assumption that they are vertical so that we can actually use our formulas. Otherwise, our <laughs> We're basically stuck. So we're going to use those basic formulas, assume the tree is vertical, but then at the end of the assignment in the evaluation, we need to reflect back and say, it's not reasonable to assume that the tree is completely vertical. It enabled us to solve the problem, but it's not reasonable. Very few trees are. Now you'll notice that is a statement. It's a single sentence. We haven't actually evaluated the reasonableness of the actual observation that we made or the assumption that we made. So we actually need to do a bit more explanation. So here's the explanation. It is not reasonable to assume that the tree is completely vertical. Few trees would grow with their trunks completely perpendicular to the ground. This means the angle formed with the ground is unlikely to be a right angle and therefore the solution cannot be completely relied upon. You'll notice what I've put in purple, this means. So that is showing your teacher and signposting that you are explaining how your evaluation is affecting the results because of the assumption that you've made. And therefore the solution, also key language that you can use to show you, we've related it back to the problem. The problem's results are not completely reliable and not completely reasonable. Here's another example using bivariate data. It is assumed that none of the people sampled had plastic surgery in order to effectively use their facial measurements to calculate correlation. So this came from an assignment where people were comparing eye width versus face height or nose width versus mouth width. Um, so we're assuming that none of the people sampled had plastic surgery. Is that a valid assumption? Well, we could basically say in our evaluation, it is not reasonable to assume that the celebrities sampled had no plastic surgery, as it is known that many do over their career. Once again, this is a statement. Yes, we do know that lots of celebrities have plastic surgery that enhances their career. However, to make that into an evaluation, I need to elaborate on how that affects my results. 
So hence their facial features are likely to be distorted, which will affect the correlation and the equation of the least squared regression line. So I've related that assumption back now, how has it actually affected my results? It's made my Pearson's correlation coefficient, it's probably distorted that and made it weaker than it would have been if they had left their faces alone. And that will also affect the equation of my least squared regression line, which I use to make predictions, because that comes out of Pearson's correlation coefficient. So once again, I've talked about what it will affect in purple. You can see that that is now the full evaluation. Let's talk quickly now about how we can organize the evaluation at the end of our assignment. A lot of students get to this part of the assignment and they just dump a few paragraphs on the page and think that's good enough, let's go. It's a great idea to actually use a subheading to identify that you're starting the next part of your assignment, which is your evaluation. It makes it really easy for your teachers to find this part of the assignment so they know where to look to award the marks to you. And of course, we want our teacher awarding us with the best possible marks. So this one uses a subheading to separate the evaluation from the rest of the assignment. You can also signpost with language inside different subheadings that you've got. For example, this is from a budgeting response and using that word reasonable really points straight out to your teacher that you're talking about the reasonableness of results. You would be surprised how many students don't use the word reasonable anywhere, reasonableness or reasonable. And it makes it really hard for us to find where you're actually talking about it, it's sort of inferred or implied. Make it really straightforward use the word reasonable and we will know straight away that is what you're talking about and we can award the mark in the right place for you. Um, and then the next thing that you should be aware of is that evaluation actually can go right throughout your report. It doesn't have to be just at the end. For example, this particular student has a scatter plot and they've talked about the scatter plot and then they've actually evaluated it straight underneath it. You can see here why they've got no association, why the association is not strong. It could be due to a number of reasons, possibly some of the assumptions. They've actually then gone and elaborated on that throughout this section. So you don't have to um, just do it at the end of your assignment. You can actually organize your evaluation so that you're evaluating as you go. Personally, I find that is a great and readable way to look at your assignment. So that when you talk about this scatter plot, you discuss it underneath, you discuss whether it's reasonable before you move on to the next thing that you create, rather than having this big mind dump at the very end of the assignment. Also thinking about how your results could be improved. This is important. You need to have a think about how could you have got a better correlation or how could you have got a better maximum result. So for junior and general and essential, as mentioned earlier, you don't need to implement those recommendations unless your task sheet is telling you to do that. On the whole, for example, if you decided that your results could be improved if you've removed, if you, if you removed some outliers, well, mention the results could be improved if outliers were removed. Even be specific, which were the outliers? One, two, three, four. If these had been removed, how would the results be improved? Well, you actually need to explain that as well. If you remove the outliers, you could potentially get a higher correlation, which will make your model that you develop far more useful for predictions. So don't just say remove outliers. You need to elaborate and explain how that will improve your results. For methods and specialists, you actually need to go ahead and implement it to refine your model. So here we've got an example from the QCAA. They've actually got a subheading in their general maths one. They've just talked about how to improve the model, they didn't actually go ahead and do it. And they've actually addressed some of the assumptions that were issues in this particular section as well. So you can see it's not all under, always under one heading, it can be under a variety of headings where we organize our evaluation. Well, if you found this video helpful, and I really hope that you did, why not like and subscribe to the channel, hit the notifications button, share the video with a teacher, or a friend, and why not even tell us in the comments how helpful you found the video. Always makes my day to get that kind of feedback. And if you've got any questions at all about anything you heard today, you can contact me at mcclutchymassayahoo.com. We're also on Facebook and Instagram, so you can direct messages there as well. And we'd love for you to join us there. There's always extra stuff going on on social media. Well, my name is Natalie McClutchy. You've been watching McClutchy Maths. Do stay tuned for our next video, which is coming up, where we're going to look at strengths and limitations of results. Have a wonderful day.